computer. That's how it works today. Andrew, I think the easiest way is when you ask people to give a round of applause, ask everyone to turn on their video as well, okay? All right, at that particular point. Okay. Adroja is giving us a nice view of the back of his computer. <laughs> Apparently the emails I sent out yesterday uh, didn't get through to everyone. Um, let me put in the live streaming link for everyone. Is Gunnar not about today? Yeah, I don't see him. Mm -hmm. I put the live streaming link up. Steve, thank you for the uh, note. I, I, I put the live streaming up. So, Peter. I was talking about the email. Yeah, I've, I've got an, an email every morning, but not this morning about the live streaming. Yes, I, I, I sent uh, one entitled Day 7 Condensed Match in All the Cities last night to the, to the uh, list server, but maybe it didn't go out to everyone. It um, might have. I think Gunnar's been sending a separate email with the live streaming, which I don't think he's done today yet. Okay. Uh, well, it, the live streaming was on that link, that email I sent yesterday. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I got it. Good, good. Okay. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, uh, since before I hand over to Andrew Ho to start things today, can I invite everyone to turn on their videos and we'll take a, we'll take a screenshot. <clears throat> Maybe it look better like this. Look at that, it's astonishing. All right, let's try that one. I'll try it, just take a few more, one second. Well, it all comes up. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. Look at all these wonderful people. Okay, uh, I'm handing over to, to you now, Andrew. It's all in your hands, you have to unmute. Okay, excellent. Let's start. So today we're fortunate to have Rosa to start off today's proceedings. Rosa did her PhD at University of Barcelona and then a habilitation at Dortmund before uh, arriving at um, Institute of Theoretical Physics uh, at University of Frankfurt, becoming a full professor uh, 10 years ago. So. One of the main interests, one of her main interests is in the theoretical physics of frustrated magnetism and quantum spin liquids in real materials that form correlated electron systems. Uh, but I also noticed just now that in her publication, she also has done some COVID modeling. So maybe she could tell us a bit during the break about that too. Sure. Anyway, today she's going to give us an overview of Kitaev models and their potential realization in materials. Uh, over to you, Rosa. 
Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share the screen um, and see whether, okay, you see my, you see my uh, uh, slides. So first of all, I would like to thank, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, thank the organizers for this opportunity to, to uh, talk and discuss with such an international uh, audience. And um, I realized that my title is very ambitious. So KITAF Models and Materials, where are we now? Um, this is, uh, in fact, a field that has been going on now for about 10 years. And to do a summary of the whole field is not possible in an hour. Um, but what I would like to do is to start with an introduction and then um, go on to a specific aspects that, uh, from my point of view, are challenging and are still puzzling nowadays. And um, a part of it, you see it here in this uh, picture where I'm showing um, ruthenium trichloride on graphene. So at the end of my talk, I will be talking about this type of uh, systems. Um, before starting, of course, I would first like to uh, acknowledge my collaborators. Without them, um, none of this work would have been possible. So they are essential for the work I will be presenting. So first of all, uh, my group in Frankfurt, David Kaip, Steve Winter, who just moved to a new position in the States, Kira Riedel and Sananda Biswas, and Ying Li, who also moved to a new position in um, China. Uh, we have been also uh, collaborating with Johannes Knolla at, uh, in Munich now, and the experimental uh, group in Augsburg from Philip Gegenbart, Alexander Zierling, and Sebastian Bachhurst. But these are not the only collaborators that I would really like to acknowledge. There, there is a long list. Uh, also with um, colleagues I've been discussing too, and uh, I just wanted to uh, say that without all these discussions and exchange of ideas, uh, this work wouldn't have been possible. So I just wanted to, to thank many of you. So let me start um, by uh, introduction, an introduction to the KITAF model. So the field of KITAF started when uh, KITAF proposed what we now know as the Kitayev model, which is in principle a very simple Hamiltonian. So this is a bond-depending Eisen model nearest, with nearest neighbor interaction on a honeycomb lattice. And what is special about this uh, Eisen model is this bond dependence. So if we go through um, the hexagon, in the, for instance, in the Z bond, we will have a Z as Z interaction in the X bond as X as X and in the Y bond as Y as Y interaction. So this model introduces a uh, high frustration in the system. And this we can just uh, see that by putting ourselves in one side. So here we have a spin that has to interact with the nearest neighbor sites with a different spin component. And since the spin components don't commute with each other, this introduces a large frustration into the system. This model is um, nevertheless exactly solvable and the ground state is a Z2 spin liquid with gapless Majorana fermions and static gap fluxes. So let me just show you um, briefly how this exact solution goes. So what Alexei Kitayev did is to use the representation of spin operators in terms of Majorana fermions. And Majorana fermions, these are fermions who uh, the particle is the same as the antiparticle. And uh, now by defining four different Majorana fermions that we call here the beta gamma, so beta X, beta Y, uh, B, sorry, B, X, B, e, B, Y, and B, Z, and C, um, we can now define, in fact, our Hamiltonian that we had originally in terms of this um, combination of uh, four different Majorana fermions. And now when we look at, in fact, at this, um, this form of the Hamiltonian, what we observe is that these B entities, which are in when, when we um, get them into this, um, uh, into this product, that these are in fact localized entities, that they don't interact with other entities um, of the same type in the hexagon. So these are in fact constants of motion. And because they are constants of motion, the Hamiltonian then 
um, becomes a, a Hamilton and in a quadratic form that we know very well how to diagonalize that. So once we have the Hamiltonian in this quadratic form, the, um, one can obtain exactly the ground state and the excitations. And here I'm showing the phase diagram by considering different values of these coupling constants uh, k. So if we are in the case that kx, ky, uh, and kz are the same, the ground state is a gapless spin liquid. And um, when we apply, and this is going to be important for um, what I'm going to um, talk about in the next slides, when we apply a magnetic field, this um, system becomes gapped and the excitation become non-abelian. And this, of course, it's a set of exotic states that are extremely interesting if we were to realize them in materials. And this is, in fact, how um, the question started um, some years ago, whether it would be possible to have a realization of this model in real materials. And in 2000, um, and before I go to how this is constructed, let us put this Hamiltonian into the context of uh, typical Hamiltonians that we know for quantum magnets. So basically, um, what we expect in a quantum magnet as interactions are, uh, and here I'm considering only the bilinear interactions, so we will expect to have isotropic exchange. Um, we may have a jalojinsky moria term, which corresponds to the um, vector product of the spin operators, and we may also have a symmetric term, where a gamma is uh, the symmetric tensor. So if we now want to impose in our quantum magnet to um, be described by only uh, this uh, Kitayev interaction that I was showing to you, it means to impose that all exchange uh, terms disappear, so are zero. The jalojinsky moria contributions should be zero. Most of the matrix elements of the symmetric term should be zero. And the only terms that remain are the diagonal uh, terms in this uh, gamma symmetric tensor, but with a dependence on the orientation of the bond, because um, as it is defined the Kitayev model, it has this bond dependence. So this seems like um, a very difficult um, set of conditions to fulfill in a material, um, but it's not. And uh, this is in fact a, a very nice work um, by, uh, by George Jacqueli and Giniat Kaliulin in 2009, where um, in fact they did this step of showing how can one engineer this type of interaction into a material. So what they proposed is the following. So because we need, uh, in fact, to have, in this case, I'm talking about SU2 spins. Um, so we need to have them bond dependent. We would need um, the effect of spin orbit coupling. So therefore, we're going to think about heavy transitional metal ions, which are in a um, D5 configuration for the following reason. So let me go through the process step by step. So um, we need a D5 configuration, but in an octahedral environment. So that means transitional metal ions with an octahedral environment, because then we will have a splitting of the D levels into lower T2G and higher EG levels. Um, this occupation five, it means five electrons in the T2G levels. If we now have that uh, the, uh, uh, this is a heavy ion, so spin orbit coupling is important, the spin orbit coupling does a further splitting of these levels into J effective three half and J effective one half. So this is, we can call then a pseudo spin. Now the occupation of five brings us into the single occupied state. Um, in, in this uh, J effective one half state. If we now consider that our systems, we're talking about D electrons are uh, correlated, a Coulomb um, repulsion will then bring my system into a J effective one half mod insulator. So 
this was the first step. We do have now the entities that um, this J effective, as you can see here is a representation of one of them, is a linear combination of my T2G orbitals with a certain component of spin. So it's a, it's a complex uh, uh, linear combination that has then this um, property of having a spin orbit entanglement. So once we have now these entities, let's see how we construct the interactions. So the idea now is to take these um, octahedra and couple them via H sharing. And the idea behind that is because if we couple them via H sharing, we will have that the exchange interactions that are um, given through uh, the hybridization with the ligand, they are destructively, um, in fact, um, they are destructing their effect. And therefore, effectively, we will have that the exchange interaction is zero. If moreover now, these um, octahedra are, um, have, are building a lattice with inversion symmetry, like the honeycomb lattice, then the jalginsky moria terms are going to be zero, and a few of the gamma uh, terms belonging to the symmetric tensor are also going to be zero. And now what remains here, oops, pardon, what remains here is basically the interactions um, between the J effective one half pseudo spin via the J effective three half states. And this interaction, so this is a virtual process, is happening because of the Huns coupling that we have between this J effective one half pseudo spins and the JZ um, plus minus three half um, of these states here. And this is nothing else as an Ising type of interaction. So now we do have in this design um, a realization of the Kitaev uh, model, where now we even know, in fact, this K, what is dependent on. So it is dependent on the Huns coupling, the hopping parameter, it's dependent on the correlation U and on the um, spin orbit coupling. So basically the scales of my problem. So once we have that, and once this paper, in fact, this suggestion came out, um, it was then um, a fast race to find materials that fulfill this kind of conditions. And here I'm showing two of them the, that, um, in fact, ruthenium trichloride is known since um, many decades, but it was never uh, looked from this perspective. So here I'm showing two examples of um, the, uh, what we call the two-dimensional Kitaev materials. So let me start with um, alpha ruthenium trichloride. So this is a system which is a layered system of these honeycombs of ruthenium surrounded by chlorine. And these uh, layers are stacked via van der Waal forces. Another example are the so-called 213 iridates Again, these are uh, hexagonal, um, 2D hexagonal uh, layers where in the middle we have a cation, either lithium or sodium, and then they are also stacked where in the, between two layers of this type, we have a layer of lithium or sodium. So this um, was um, very good news. Um, however, these systems are not for not fulfilling perfectly the conditions I was showing to you. So they showed trigonal distortions. Um, there are other interaction paths that are non-zero in the, when, the, when one considers all the interactions in the system. So um, this gives rise to the fact that the description of the system is not only um, having this term surviving, the Kitaev term, but also other contributions. And um, even though in all these systems, the Kitaev contribution is the strongest one because of the presence of the other contributions that I'm going to describe um, in a moment, um, these systems in fact show at low temperatures, a uh, long range magnetic order. So for instance, the examples I'm showing here, alpha ruthenium trichloride and sodium uh, iridate, they uh, show these uh, this uh, zigzag magnetic order. 
the alpha lithium iridate and the 3D versions um, of the lithium iridate, they have more complex orderings that they also order. So in fact, Jeff Rao and Heyong Ki were one of the first to, um, to realize that um, there would be other interactions apart from KITAF that are important for the description of these systems. And let me show you with which interactions are those. So we have this, um, the contribution of what we call off-diagonal anisotropic interactions. So let's assume that we are in, a, in the gamma is equal to the Z bond. So if we have the S, SIZ, SJZ, um, also contributing to the interactions are the SIX, SI, um, SJY, as well as the, what we call the gamma prime, which would be in this case SX, um, uh, SZ, or an XY, SZ. So these terms are indeed, an, um, these um, are various calculations from from up initio, where one can um, derive these uh, spin Hamiltonians that uh, in fact show the presence of these interactions. And um, let me tell you maybe now some words about the sign of these interactions because it's important when we analyze in fact the behavior of the systems and uh, the excitation spectrum. So what do we know about the sign of the interactions? So the, um, from up initial, if one starts from first principles, those DFT calculations, and then uses various methods to obtain these um, spin Hamiltonians, so either projective methods as we're using, or total energy methods, or a perturbation theory, one comes to the conclusion that in this material, so the chemistry, um, and now let me, um, let me concentrate on one of these materials, alpha ruthenium trichloride. So um, chemistry is telling us that this KTF interaction is ferromagnetic, um, while this gamma interaction is antiferromagnetic. Now, there are independent of these up initial, um, uh, up initial calculations, one can also obtain conditions on these um, coupling constants by following the experimental observations. So for instance, Chalupka and uh, Kaliulin, they in fact showed that if we know um, from experiments the orientation of the magnetic moment in the ordered phase, this is restricting what kind of um, signs and values you can get, you, can, you have to have for these anisotropic interactions. Um, and here I'm, so for instance, um, uh, the group of Steve Nagler, they in fact measured this um, uh, ordered magnetic moment. And um, later on, this has been in fact uh, used, this is a recent work on that, that confirms also what up initial uh, calculations show that in this, ma in this material, the, um, the K, the Kita F term is ferromagnetic and gamma is antiferromagnetic. And there is a very recent work by uh, Pavel Maximos, Maximov and uh, Sasha Chernyshev where um, they concentrate on the experimental observations in ESR and terahertz spectroscopy at high uh, magnetic fields um, and show in fact that this also constrains what kind of uh, parameters uh, this uh, quantum system can be described with. So, <clears throat> Um, there is the positive side is that this system is uh, highly anisotropic concerning the interactions. The let's say less uh, less uh, good news is that it's not a spin liquid in the ground state. We uh, saw last week. Let me maybe uh, go once back. We saw last week. In fact, there is one system that uh, shows no order. That uh, and Hide Takagi was uh, in fact. Um, discussing it because uh, this is a system that uh, he and his group have been working on. I won't be talking about this system today. I will um, stay first with um, the materials, uh, in fact, more concentrated on ruthenium trichloride. But if uh, time is left, we can also discuss this material. So let me now um, go and uh, try to uh, see what these complex uh, um, low, low symmetry interactions 
are giving us as um, uh, in fact how the system is behaving due, due to these um, low symmetry interactions. And um, here what I'm showing on the, on the right side are various experimental observations. And on the left side, I'm showing uh, theoretical calculations by using this minimal model with these parameters that I was showing to you. So a Kitayev, a gamma uh, term, and then a J1 and our third neighbors uh, Heisenberg term. And these values are obtained from up initial calculations. And uh, basically what I want to show here is that the um, observed excitations in this system are extremely uh, anomalous. It's not what one expects, of course, if we had a purely Heisenberg system. So let me show you here, for instance, the neutron scattering um, data from the Oak Ridge in the ordered phase. So one observes this around the gamma point, this would correspond to the magnon excitations, but what one observes is this strong um, continua that really is going in a very uh, w large width of energies. Um, and there has been a lot of discussion whether this continua could be related to Majorana excitations. And here is how, in fact, this kind of spectra can be reproduced by this type of models. These are uh, here exact diagonalization of this model for um, large clusters. Um, in fact, just to show that these kind of models is um, uh, describing these uh, excitations. Other uh, properties, for instance, are that uh, at finite temperature, one observes that there is a lot of um, transfer of spectral weight from one K point to gamma. This is, for instance, these, these experiments by Doe and collaborators. And um, this type of models at finite temperature can also describe this um, uh, spectral weight transfers. And um, what I'm going to talk now is about the effects of uh, field excitations. So in fact, um, just to um, uh, stop for a moment, um, why, uh, why we are putting so much effort in understanding this one material. Um, so the idea is the following. So one of the uh, most elusive uh, um, states in condensed matter is a spin liquid uh, state. And we saw it now with the Kitayev model that the Kitayev model, the ground state is a spin liquid, so a C2 spin liquid, but um, if one can realize this model, then in a material, then we would have uh, the realization of a spin liquid. So one of the motivations that one can uh, put oneself about these materials that are not that far away from these uh, uh, having pure Kitayev interactions is to uh, just think about what can we do to the material to shift. So in this case, I'm talking about rosinium trichloride, but it's also valid by the for the it's also valid for the 213 systems. What uh, can I do to shift the system away from the uh, zigzag long range order and try to see whether we are able to reach maybe a spin liquid state? So one possibility is this is a quantum magnet, so we can manipulate a quantum magnet with a magnetic field. So what happens, what if we apply a magnetic field to the system, what we will expect is that at a, a critical magnetic field, we are going to suppress the, the, the long range order. And the question is whether before reaching the field polarized phase at large fields, whether there is an intermediate uh, spin liquid phase. But there is another way to manipulate the system, which is by, for instance, applying strain fields. So um, these coupling constants, so basically these constants that describe the uh, uh, spin interactions in the system are extremely dependent on, uh, the, uh, on, the, uh, on the structure of the system. And um, as I will show later, very small changes in the structure um, produce huge changes in these, um, in these coupling constants. So the question is whether by applying adequate strain fields to the system, one can then uh, bring the system near the region where the only surviving interaction would be the Kitayev interaction. 
And here, this is going to be uh, in the second part of my talk, I will be talking about pressure effects and effects of straining the system, for instance, by building heterostructures. So here, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, which has been, in fact, experimentally realized. But <clears throat> this, um, the, feel, the, the field induced phases is indeed a fascinating um, field right now of um, discussion. So uh, I would like to start by uh, discussing what um, we know from experiments about these field induced phases. And I apologize that I won't be able to uh, show all experiments, really nice experiments on these, um, on, on uh, ruthenium trichloride on the magnetic field. I just took a choice of them, um, but I'm happy uh, to discuss because many of my colleagues are here about uh, others. So here, I, let me start by one of the very first um, experiments um, on um, uh, ruthenium trichloride on the magnetic field. And this is uh, a work done by Roger Johnson and Radu Koldea in Oxford. So basically, um, they had a single crystal. And um, what I'm uh, going to show here is that, and what we are going to expect is that due to this very anisotropic spin interactions that I was commenting about ruthenium trichloride, we are going to expect very different uh, response depending on in which direction we are applying the magnetic field. So what I'm showing here is the phase diagram that uh, um, uh, Roger and Radu obtain um, for the case when the magnetic field is applied in plane. So for an in-plane magnetic field, so if, when the magnetic field is zero, the system um, in fact goes into the paramagnetic phase at 14 Kelvin. At that time, um, the single crystal had a lot of um, stacking faults. So nowadays we know that if we can, one can reduce the number of stacking faults in the sample, the uh, critical uh, temperature is then about uh, six to seven uh, Kelvin. So now, um, by applying a magnetic field in plane, um, what they observe is that the uh, long range magnetic order is suppressed uh, between eight and nine Teslas. And now what I want to show here is that if we observe the um, behavior of the magnetization as a function of magnetic field for uh, by whether we apply a magnetic field parallel to the Z direction or in plane, you see how different is the response. So while in the uh, application of a magnetic field parallel to C, we are still deep into this ordered phase, the application of the in-plane magnetic field at about um, seven, eight Teslas, there is a transition from the ordered phase, and one can see it here by following the temperature behavior, um, where um, in this region, the long range order is lost. And uh, in fact, they even went to larger uh, magnetic fields, so up to 60 Teslas. And what uh, I would like to show here is that even at, very high, at these very high fields, the system doesn't reach saturation. And we would expect that because of these anisotropic um, uh, contributions, so that it's very, one has to go to really large fields to saturate um, the magnetization. So these were um, one of the first experiments showing the behavior of the system on the magnetic field. And what I'm showing here is in order to have an idea of this strong anisotropy, I'm showing, I'm showing now um, a phase diagram, this is at t equals zero, of the ground state of the system as a function of um, magnetic field by considering the magnetic field um, from in plane, out of plane, so zero degrees, out of plane 90 degrees and back to in plane. Just to show you how the ground state is um, the zigzag uh, uh, long range order is extremely dependent on, um, in fact, in which orientation we are with the applied magnetic field. So when we are here in plane, again, the zigzag long range order is lost at about eight to 10, so eight, six, seven, uh, eight Teslas, while for um, a magnetic field perpendicular to the plane of the system, 
one has to go to very high fields to um, start um, uh, suppressing the long range order. Question? So, Rosa, can yes. I ask a question? Yeah. Yes. Can you uh, tell us uh, whether at these high fields you're approaching the point where the J equals one half and three halves are starting to mix? How, well, how do okay. the fields compare with this, the splitting of the, those two multiple, the multiple? That's, the that's a very good question since um, indeed now what I'm showing here is uh, in fact assuming now basically the pure uh, one half. Uh, um, so, so I'm doing these simulations with a purely J effective one half uh, system. Mm -hmm. um, when uh, indeed this is uh, a very uh, important question when you are at these very large uh, scales, then you have also to take into account the effect of the three halves. So this is an important point. Um, but this is not going to, um, to suppress when you, um, when you, so this is not going to necessarily suppress your zigzag order. So still you have to go to very high fields, but yes, one has to consider then these degrees of freedom. Thank this you. Um, is a simplification that we do in the model. <laughs> So, so what I um, my uh, what I want to show you with this uh, phase diagram, uh, which is obtained by by these anisotropic models, is where are we now? So, all the experimental discussion, because what um, as I was trying to motivate, the question is um, whether when we suppress the, this uh, long range zigzag order, whether there is an intermediate spin liquid uh, region before reaching the um, por polarized uh, phase. So all the experimental discussion, discussion is in this region because these are also the available uh, magnetic fields. These are more available magnetic fields in the lab. However, the, um, the, uh, there is a lot of development on the theoretical side to propose, um, and in fact, a lot of interesting um, spin liquid phases when the magnetic field is applied perpendicular to the plane, which would mean for the experimentalists uh, to go to these really high magnetic fields. And these I'm just showing here a choice of them that um, if you include to your Hamiltonian, not only the Kita F term, but also this gamma and gamma primes term that I was uh, saying they are necessary to describe the system, then you get a, a very interesting phases um, here uh, with these orientations of the magnetic fields. But up to now, none of the, um, none of the um, models that have been uh, analyzed shows an intermediate um, spin liquid phase for in-plane um, fields, except if we consider that we have the pure KITIF model. So let me now go um, and try to um, guide you through um, what, what is there about the experimental, uh, what the experimental um, features are when we are in this region. And then we will um, see uh, how we deal with that. So here I'm showing, and so now I'm concentrating because of this strong anisotropy, where I apply a field um, uh, parallel to A or B or perpendicular, I'm going for the, for, the, for the rest of the time, I'm going to concentrate on experiments that consider an in-plane magnetic field along the A direction. And we call the A direction, the direction which is perpendicular to the ruthenium-ruthenium bonds. And here, um, let me show the um, a very nice experiment, also again by the group of Oak Ridge. Um, where they show here susceptibility uh, measurements for this in-plane uh, magnetic field along the A direction. And basically the susceptibility shows two peaks, um, let's call it BC1 and BC2, which uh, in fact correspond, and this uh, we can see it in the next, so these peaks correspond to a phase transition, the first one from an antiferromagnetic um, phase, the zigzag phase, to a second ferromag uh, antiferromagnetic phase. Let me show that in the next slide. So here is, um, in fact, also from uh, Oak Ridge Group, an analysis of uh, this region. Let me, start, let me first start with this region where we saw 
these, um, uh, the behavior of the susceptibility. So what it seems to happen um, when you apply the magnetic field, um, that there is at these values of magnetic field between six and seven, there is a change um, of the Q vector uh, of the ordering Q vector from a, a zigzag that uh, they call it one to a zigzag two phase. And these are in fact what um, the fact that there is these two trend, this, this first transition would correspond to this BC uh, antiferromagnetic one and the second transition corresponds to the full suppression of the long range order. The experiments that are shown here are magnetocaloric effect experiments, susceptibility experiments, neutron diffraction experiments, these are these three points, and uh, inelastic uh, um, neutron scattering. So basically what um, these uh, measurements show is um, that uh, after suppressing the long range order, um, the region of the field polarized, so when they observe clearly the, um, the, uh, the one magnon state corresponding to the field polarized, um, corresponds to this region here. And then the question is, of course, whether in between, in this region here, there could still be a, a spin liquid um, phase surviving. So this is um, basically now um, corresponding to these measurements. But now let me show you the measurements that have been um, really um, uh, very uh, important in this, um, in this field which is uh, the thermal hull conductivity measurements from the group of Yuji Matsuda in um, Tokyo. And I'm showing here the most recent experiments because um, in this uh, case, um, for these measurements, they are considering the application of the magnetic field along the A direction, which is what I'm trying now to concentrate on, only the field in one uh, given direction. So, um, these, the thermal hull uh, conductivity measurements. The idea is to measure the heat current perpendicular to an applied um, temperature gradient under the application of a magnetic field. And what they observe is that for a magnetic field applied along the A direction, there is um, a region uh, of the um, thermal hull conductivity, which is this region here between 10 and 11 uh, Teslas, where the value of the thermal hull conductivity is quantized at a value, and this is the value in this one half of this unit, is precisely the quantization that is predicted um, if we consider the Kitaev model and we apply a magnetic field. So this will give rise to a chiral spin liquid, a gapped chiral spin liquid with uh, fractionalized excitations and therefore this quantization. Um, if the magnetic field is applied along the B direction, there is no quantization. So this has been in fact a subject of uh, long and is a subject of long discussions um, since now, uh, let me show you a couple more of experiments about the thermal hull conductivity because um, of the following. So in the, considering now this uh, experiment here, the corresponding phase diagram that is also shown by the authors for uh, the case of um, the system is the following. So there's the, the zigzag order um, is suppressed at about uh, seven Teslas, like we know here also from, um, from other uh, experiments. But they seem to find this um, quantization at larger magnetic fields. So as if there were a spin liquid, the spin liquid would be not um, raising uh, after the, the suppression of the long range order, but uh, at some fields further away. And moreover, there is um, another study by members of, uh, so by uh, co-authors of this uh, work, where they find in fact a very important sample dependence of this uh, quantized thermal conductivity. So here, for instance, I'm showing uh, the results with uh, a given sample uh, of the quantization, while 
um, um, previous um, results from uh, Yuji uh, Matsuda group show the quantization to happen here at this region of magnetic fields. And in this recent work, the quantization is at much larger magnetic fields. So there is still here um, something to be understood, um, why there is the sample dependence. And um, what uh, I think it's important is, it seems that in all these samples, the suppression of the long range order is happening at the same uh, field. However, this uh, quantized um, state appears in different range of fields, depending on the sample. So, um, for instance, considering this case, we would be, and here I'm showing another um, experiment. So for, these are Raman experiments um, from the group of Peter Lehmanns, also the group of um, Paul van Lostrich uh, has performed um, Raman on the magnetic field and the results are very similar. So in this region, we are in the gap region where there is a clear presence of um, this magnon, magnon corresponding to the uh, polarized field polarized phase. So there is here a question about um, how, what is happening in this system. So in principle, we would have two scenarios uh, depending on which, uh, which um, measurement we are looking at, one scenario would be that after suppression of the long range zigzag order, um, the, the system has, here is a quantum critical point, and then there is an adiabatic uh, going, so the, the, this continues adiabatically into the field polarized phase without um, a true intermediate phase. The second scenario, which um, is the scenario that these thermal hall conductivity measurements, um, in fact, seem to show, is um, that after suppressing the long range magnetic order, there is an intermediate spin liquid phase, which is in fact described by the Kitayev um, spin liquid. And then at some uh, larger uh, magnetic field, we should go into the field polarized phase. So the question that we posed ourselves is the following. So if whatever of these two scenarios is happening in thermodynamics, we should be seeing, um, in fact, these phase transitions. So if we assume that we have an intermediate spin liquid phase uh, of the kind that these quantized thermal hall conductivity are showing, it means that this is a topologically non-trivial phase. Um, while the ordered uh, zigzag um, magnetism is a topologically trivial phase and the same for the field polarized phase. So we expect that thermodynamically, we are going to expect to see phase transitions. So one here and one here. So this is why we decided um, together with our colleagues in, um, 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 in uh, so Philip Gegenbart and collaborators to look at thermodynamics. And what exactly we are going to look? So we are going to look at the magnetic Grüneisen parameter. So the Grüneisen parameter. Sorry, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah, it's just just on the previous slide. Um, I'm just very curious why, if there's an intermediate spin liquid phase, it should be described by the Kitayev model because the symmetries look to be very different. Well, that's that's one of the puzzles that we don't understand. We really don't understand um, why. That's, that's exactly the point. While um, many of us uh, have been trying to uh, find models where um, we include not only the spin, uh, the, the Kitayev interactions, but also the other interactions that we know are important in order to see whether we can uh, find this phase. And um, that's the problem. The models don't show the appearance of this phase. And this is a puzzle. So right now we don't understand that because, as you uh, as you say, this um, this quantization that um, is is uh, observed in uh, Tokyo. This is the quantization predicted for the pure Kitayev model. So it's a puzzle. Okay, thank you. That's yeah. So let's look at thermodynamics. And um, last week, uh, Premi. Uh, Chandra, she introduced the, the Grüneisen parameter 
as a very sensitive uh, thermodynamic um, measurement to, in fact, track uh, quantum phase transitions. And um, what I'm going to talk uh, today is um, about the magnetic Grunison parameter in order to be able to track the possible uh, phase transitions in the system on the magnetic field. So how do we define the, uh, the magnetic Grunison parameter? So it's given by the ratio of the uh, derivative of the magnetization with respect to the temperature and the specific heat. So if we now observe, um, look at um, the specific heat behavior as a function of magnetic field at a given temperature, this is two Kelvin. What one observes in the specific heat and the magnetic field here is applied uh, not exactly along the A direction. So it seems it's very difficult to align these samples. It has um, uh, an, a misalignment of about 10 degrees. So what um, specific heat shows is um, there is a, an anomaly at this BC uh, that we call BCAF1 at about six Kelvin. And there is a second very um, a strong anomaly at BCAF2, which would correspond to these two phases that um, were also seen in um, susceptibility measurements. Now, if we look at the, um, at the Grunison parameter, and that's why it's such a sensitive probe, one observes that at uh, this uh, first um, uh, anomaly in the specific heat, there is a clear um, maximum here. And this is um, indicating that uh, probably this, um, this um, phase transition this, between these two magnetic states is of weak first order. And then we have a clear um, second order phase transition where the Grunison parameter is changing sign. And this corresponds to the phase transition between um, suppressing the long range order in the system. And what this um, uh, analysis of the Grunison parameter shows is a shoulder. This shoulder here um, that um, the sh the sh we, we call the shoulder at B star, which is about 10 Tesla. And I will be trying to discuss about this shoulder in a moment, if we take the shoulder seriously, what could the shoulder tell us about the system on the field? So if we now, now oh, go Rosa, back Rosa, to- uh, Rosa, there's a yes. question, a yes. question from Mazaki Oshi Oshikawa. Sorry? There's a question from Mazaki Oshikawa. He says, could, okay. you, could you remind us the experimental evidence that the region B antiferromagnetic C1 uh, less than B antiferromagnetic C2 still has the antiferromagnetic long range order. Yes. Oh yes, yes. Um, these are the experiments and maybe, um, in fact, Steve Nagel is here, he can comment, oh sorry, he can comment on these experiments. These are yeah, uh, Steve's I, I experiments. I can say uh, here. What, what isn't here, uh, there's actually a neutron diffraction that shows precisely what this is. So what's labeled ZZ1 is zigzag in the plane with a three layer stacking. And what's labeled ZZ2 is zigzag in the plane with a six layer stacking. And we know this from diffraction that uh, it's been circulated a bit, but it's unpublished. And uh, we, we also know the dependence of those boundaries on the orientation of the field in the plane. So when the field's along B, they're very close together, perhaps merged. When the field is perpendicular to the bond, you see the maximum split, which is shown here. I hope that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so, okay, more questions? Okay, so let me continue on uh, now um, analyzing these phase transitions. Um, first of all, because we are the theories and we always look whether we um, can get with this, um, in fact, this type of spin models that we saw that can, can describe quite a lot of the experiments, where, whether we can also explain um, the behavior of the Grunison parameter. Here I'm showing the experiment and here I'm showing the theoretical results and uh, a couple of disclaimers. Uh, of course, we, and uh, Steve, thanks for the uh, explanation. Steve showed that 
for this phase transition, you need to consider three dimensional uh, long range order. Um, our model is now for a 2D system, so we are not going to be able to describe this phase transition, but definitely we are describing the phase transition when the, when the long range order is suppressed. Um, the calculations show a much more smeared out behavior due to the fact that these are exact diagonalization on finite clusters, and therefore there is a finite size effect. But what this model don't show is this type of shoulder. So we then um, decided to say, okay, let's forget about the models for the moment and let's try to um, understand what uh, a Grunison, a shoulder in a Grunison parameter, what kind of information this can tell us, especially if it's a shoulder that it's clearly not indicating a phase transition. So um, what we did, and this um, is, uh, I have to here mention David Kaip, a PhD in Frankfurt, who, who worked out all, all, all these uh, thermodynamics. So let's have a look at the Grunison parameter here, lambda, it can be uh, P if it's a volume Grunison parameter, or it can be B if it's uh, the magnetic Grunison parameter. I will be here staying with the magnetic Grunison parameter. So if we do the limit of the Grunison parameter, at t equals zero, basically um, for a system that has a gap, delta, basically the Grunison parameter can be written as uh, the derivative of uh, delta as a function of the parameter, in this case is a magnetic field, divided by the, um, uh, the gap. So if we now, with this expression, we can analyze a first order phase transition given by a level crossing, we get, uh, indeed, the Grunison parameter gives the, the uh, behavior that one uh, expects, which is corresponds to this, um, to this, uh, 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 to this divergence um, here at the, at the level crossing. And for the case of a continuous quantum phase transition, then the Grunison parameter will show this change of sign. So um, what we can now can, um, uh, explore is, well, let's consider about um, the behavior of the lowest excitation. So we could have at finite fields that um, at some given field, um, we could have the crossing of excitations coming from neighbor, um, neighbor phases in the system. So competing phases in the system. So here I'm showing that pictorically. So in the case that I have um, crossing of low lying excitations coming from different k vectors, for instance, if I'm considering ordered states, this automatically gives in the Grunison parameter a step behavior, which at finite temperature will be a shoulder behavior. Um, while this is the specific heat doesn't show any sign of this effect here. So um, indeed here, this kind of behavior is telling us that the Grunison parameter can show a shoulder when we have crossing of lowest excitation coming from, from different competing states, near states that are nearby. Let me show you a ca case one. So when one take for the description of the uh, ruthenium trichloride, a more complete model than um, these uh, five parameters that I was showing to you. In fact, what we find at finite field is that there is a crossing of, um, of two uh, low-lying um, low excited states corresponding, in fact, to a different case. So this would be the zigzag order, and this would be the ferromagnetic order. And this would give, um, in fact, after suppressing the long-range um, uh, order, would give this kind of shoulder. Or a more exotic case is we do have um, yeah, um, for the case of the, I don't know how my time is doing. How much is my time? Um, you've done one hour, almost sure. one hour. So we, we sh uh, expect to be getting into a, a question time in, let's say, five, ten minutes. Is that possible? Okay, okay, because uh, I wanted to show uh, the graphene. So, so let me just, um, this more exotic, so I wanted to go to the strain uh, case. So if you give me six minutes, that sure. should, should be fine. So um, basically, 
a more exotic uh, uh, case would be the following. So we know that the antiferromagnetic ferromagnetic KTF uh, model has in fact um, very interesting phases. So um, in the antiferromagnetic ferromagnetic the spin, the, the KTF spin liquid in fact survives for larger values of magnetic field. And there is a second uh, spin liquid phase, which is uh, called a U1 um, a spin liquid. Now, what we know for, um, from uh, this work from Chalupka and uh, Giniat is that if we apply uh, hidden, the hidden symmetries, if we apply these symmetries to uh, the antiferromagnetic KTF model, in fact, we have that this model is equivalent to a ferromagnetic uh, KTF model plus other interactions, so gamma, gamma, uh, gamma and J interactions. And this model, in fact, is rather near in parameters to the model of the ruthenium trichloride. So what I want to say here is that um, such a phase, if it's nearby um, the, uh, the if, if ruthenium trichloride has such a phase nearby, competing with the state of the ruthenium trichloride, once we go to a field where the zigzag order is suppressed, then um, one may get this shoulder in the um, Grunison parameter due to the fact that there is a nearby phase where the system never enters to it, but it feels the excitations of this phase. So um, concluding this uh, part, and then the, the next five minutes, I will talk uh, about a uh, strain. Concluding this part, um, if we take this shoulder seriously, uh, and in fact, other measurements, so for instance, in magnet restriction, also shoulders have been uh, reported uh, at this range of magnetic fields. Um, what uh, we propose that these shoulders uh, are describing is the presence of nearby competing phases without the system really going into this competing phase. And of course, the big question is, which is the relation to the thermal hole conductivity measurements? And this is something that needs to be explored. So let me now in my last five minutes, just tell you um, shortly about um, what happens with the strain fields. And as I was telling to you, um, the uh, exchange parameters are extremely dependent on, uh, in fact, the hybridizations that you have in the system. And just to show here, if we change a little bit this um, angle between these, uh, these two ruthenium atoms, then we can, we can have very strong changes on the uh, interactions as a function of this angle. So that means that if we apply uh, pressure or strain, we are going to be able to manipulate these interactions. What does pressure do, which is um, the first experiment that was uh, Ruth, done. So, sorry to interrupt, there is a um, question about about two slides ago from Yasha. Yes, let me go back. This one? Uh, uh, Yasha, can you uh, unmute yourself? Uh, yeah. I, so uh, my question was that the, the, the shoulder in the experiment seems to be horizontally rather a plateau, whereas your, uh, your phenomenological uh, finite energy crossing gave, gave vertical shoulders. So can you comment about it? Is it possible to get these plateaus out of those kind of models? Okay, so our explanation of this is in fact uh, a smearing of temperature. So if I, of course, the, 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 basically this, um, this very strong um, uh, step is because it, it was a T equals zero um, calculation, but as soon as you um, go to higher temperatures, you start smearing out. Um, that's, of course, one can now try to analyze further and perfection that. Um, this was now done uh, by considering a simple crossing of two, um, of two levels. Uh, we know that, of course, we do have uh, this continuum of excitations. You have to then improve on this model. And probably then one can make a better quantitative um, uh, explanation of, of this shoulder. Yep. So, um, so pressure, applying pressure on ruthenium trichloride, uh, here what I'm showing is the optical conductivity measurements of the phonons, and these are the uh, in-plane phonons. So what 
pressure does to the system basically is that it distorts the system. So at a critical pressure of about 1.9 gigapascals, the system distorts and basically um, it forms a static uh, state of uh, spin uh, singlets. So therefore no chance here to get a spin liquid. Um, and now I come to my last two minutes. Um, going back to my first slide about what happens when uh, ruthenium trichloride is uh, put on top of graphene. And here I'm mentioning two experiments on that. One is done in Washington University in St. Louis, um, Zoo and collaborators, and the other one was done in um, uh, Stuttgart at the Max Planck Institute. So um, I'm showing here the construction at the Max Planck Institute. So basically, um, they put um, graphene uh, and ruthenium, uh, then a top layer of hexagonal boronitrite, and uh, the, the device uh, in order to measure transport is just basically um, put together with these uh, gold um, contacts. So with that, they could then measure um, resistivity in the system. And here I'm showing um, as a function of volt uh, voltage, what they observe is uh, basically the, the conductivity. What they observe is that by doing this construction, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, there is an uh, increase in the, so there is a better conduction uh, in graphene and there is a charge transfer. And the question is what happens with this charge transfer? Um, here I'm showing um, uh, the Hassmann alpha oscillations and the corresponding Fourier transform of the magneto resistant that clearly shows as a function of temperature, the presence of two um, whole pockets, of two pockets. I mean, I will show that these whole pockets, two whole pockets in the system so that the system is conducting. What is interesting is that uh, the temperature evolution of this uh, fast Fourier transform um, is non-monotonic. And this is also telling us something about the system. So uh, Sananda Visbas uh, basically did many um, uh, simulations on uh, heterostructures of ruthenium trichloride on graphene in order to be able to analyze these experiments. And uh, these are some examples, but basically the um, heterostructure that has lower energy is this hexagonal cell. And as you see, there is a strong um, mismatch between the lattice parameters of the graphene and of the ruthenium trichloride. So that means that putting ruthenium trichloride on graphene is a straining ruthenium trichloride. And what is happening then is that um, when, by doing this construction, uh, there is a charge transfer from the graphene to the ruthenium trichloride. So the graphene re becomes whole dope. That's why the conductivity um, gets uh, higher. And this is, you see it here, it becomes whole dope. And these bands here are the bands of the ruthenium. So, um, what is happening then? And the question is, why is this anomalous behavior as a function of temperature of um, the uh, fast Fourier transform of the magnetic resistance? And there are two scenarios. One is at this temperature, ruthenium trichloride orders. So it could be, uh, oops, it could be the spin scattering um, effects, or it could be the fact that we have a flat band that is hybridizing with, um, this is a flat band, basically a hybridizing with um, uh, graphene. So um, what uh, we then um, found out is that uh, this tensile strain applied on ruthenium trichloride enhances the Kitaev interactions and reduces, in fact, these other anisotropic interactions that um, are, uh, in, that are let's say the interaction that you wouldn't like if you want to bring the system into the spin liquid phase. And moreover, what we have here now is a doped Kitaev um, uh, system because of this charge transfer from the graphene, graphene so that we would be done um, describing the behavior of the system in terms of soja Hamiltonian. And now this is really my last slide. What I'm showing here is basically a phase diagram of this um, doped uh, uh, Kitaev, uh, Kita, so uh, doped Kitaev uh, model. And here it's a phase diagram by Hiart and collaborators. 
where um, it's interesting to see that if we just put here the parameters of this uh, ruthenium trichloride on graphene, we are in this region where the system could even show um, a kind of unconventional superconductivity. So here is my last slide um, where I would uh, like to conclude that um, the, uh, I hope that I could show you a little bit um, why uh, these uh, Kitaev models and materials are interesting. Uh, where are our fossils um, right now uh, in this field induced phases, trying to understand um, the fact that uh, all uh, experiments don't really agree in um, basically what is the behavior that is happening in this intermediate region. And we, we need to uh, really try to develop more um, ideas on that. So there is very recent uh, ideas by uh, Hei Young, uh, Key, where uh, she proposes to uh, look at uh, torque, in-plane torque, uh, maybe to see some of these effects. And on the other hand, there is also a whole field uh, to explore by considering this type of ethereal structure. So combining Kitaev physics with uh, graphene physics. And with that, I would like to thank for thank you for your attention, and I'm uh, happy to answer your questions. Hey, let's unmute and uh, clap for a um, uh, really great talk. Questions? You can either uh, uh, raise your hand or uh, put down something in the chat, please. Um, okay, so the first one I get is from Stephen Nagler. Hi, it was a great talk. Uh, I have a question about the B star observed in the Grunizen uh, experiments. Um, you showed data at two Kelvin. Is there a te temperature dependence on B star? Yes, is there is. Known? In fact, it, at, at higher temperatures, it disappears. And so, at lower temperatures, does it reduce or does it? Uh... No, it's stronger. So, low, well, okay, they, they only went on to two Kelvin. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's the data that uh, I can, I, I showed you. So I don't know, they, they need to go to uh, lower temperatures to see whether, um, how, how this gets stronger. I mean, I was trying. I guess so I was wondering if the if the field varies in the same way as it seems to in the magnetocaloric effect. Uh, yeah, good point because you did these measurements of the magnetocaloric effect, right? Yes. Um, and uh, the thing is that um, talking to them, they say that okay, they have this pure this this perfect adiabatic conditions by um, by doing these measurements. So I don't know how they compare with your uh, wrapping up and down um, of the magnetic field, but. Mm -hmm. This is a question, in fact, for, for Philip. This I don't know. All right, thanks. Yeah. Okay, the next question from Liang Wu. Liang, can you uh, unmute us? Oh, great. Sure. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, so hi, Harris. I have a question on uh, the U1, U1 uh, spin liquid picture you proposed. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. So, Right. So, so here, so uh, I'm curious. So here, the little edge is also the field, right? The field direction. Um, okay. So here, what I'm, what, what the, so here, what I'm showing is now. These are the exact normalization calculations. Are you asking about so the, 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 here, the right, or are you the, the asking right about phase diagram? There is a edge. Oh, okay. So this phase diagram is a phase diagram where. Um, as a function of an in-plane magnetic field, um, what we have in this axis is at this H, we do have this H tilde, which basically has exactly the same phase diagram as the antiferromagnetic Kitaev. And here we have the, um, the Hamiltonian of ruthenium trichloride. And from going from, I'm sorry that I didn't put that on the slide, this epsilon is basically a combination of the parameters between this H tilde and this uh, and the parameters of ruthenium trichloride. So what I'm uh, in order to get these phases, um, I should manipulate a little bit ruthenium trichloride in order to bring it into this into this region. Okay. So, 
Is this your question? Yeah, kind of. But but in terms of experiments, yes. so then, uh, like, is it possible that if you apply implement field, the system can transit from a zigzag phase to a U1 spring liquid? Without, without um, manipulating Rosino trichloride, let's say, um, putting strain or some kind, um, I don't think so because um, this, let me just show you maybe in the next slide, it was better to see. Um, no, where is my, here. Uh, when I was here, sorry. You see the steel, uh, even though we do have, um, this, this, these are the uh, parameters that where you do, do have this uh, S1 spin liquid corresponds to these parameters. And if you compare them with the parameters for the ruthenium drug, right, still they are different. So that means you need to manipulate a little bit the system if you want to bring the, the ruthenium drug right really into this uh, U1 phase. But um, what I was trying to say is that it could well be that this is a competing phase in, in that, that it is there and um, whether uh, you could manipulate the system in order to approach uh, resume drag right into these type of phases. And I do, the first thing you would see would be in terms of these shoulders until you really hit uh, maybe the phase transition. So this is the message of this type of phase diagram that um, in principle, you, can, you could manipulate your resume drag right a little bit more since this phase is somewhere there in the phase space, not that far away from uh, the parameters of Rosinium trichloride. Uh, do, do you mind ask another quick question? So, so do you think, so, so I, I think if there is a, so if, if there is a, a U1 spin liquid, somehow you can induce. So there has to be another second phase transition to a field polarized state, right? So, yes, yes, here it is. Oh, I, I see, I see. So then, the, the, Sorry, this is a blow up of this region here. This is the blow up. So then sorry. I'm curious. So yes. So like, uh, sorry, I, I'm not very familiar with U1 spring liquid with some, let's say, neutral, like firm surface. So like for, for U1 spring liquid with neutral firm surface, can can it also host like a thermal hole? Uh, <laughs> In fact, this is a gapless. Um, it, it, yes, exactly. This is a gapless um, uh, spin liquid and. This is a, a well-posed question. Uh, I don't know. I, I, so, in principle, uh, it would be interesting to uh, to look at that. Uh, what happens with the thermal hull in this type of um, phase uh, here? That uh, at least uh, is is there in these uh, phase diagrams when you um, when you put a magnetic field, and um, basically when you uh, try to make the the model into a region where you could compare with the models for theorem trichloride. So it would be very interesting to see what happens with thermal hall uh, for this type of phase. Yes, uh, but yeah, wait a second. I mean, if, yeah, uh, the it, it would be very different from the Kitayev, um, uh, from the chiral Kitayev uh, spin liquid, right? Because in the chiral Kitayev, you, you need a gap in order to see these um, excitations. So it would be it would be interesting to see what happens with thermal hall. I don't know. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, the next person on the list, Yi Peng. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about uh, the B star, and uh, did I understand it correctly that nearby this uh, B star field, the interlayer coupling is kind of like you know um, uh, competing with. Each other in some sense. So my question is that maybe is it possible that you can apply some kind of pressure, like uniaxial, such that you can see uh, whether this B star is related to the interlayer coupling, maybe enhance it or like a suppress it. Um, so so what you are asking is 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 the the um, what would be here the role of the three-dimensional yeah. coupling? I mean, this is an open question. And in fact, uh, it would be interesting to see that, um, so, okay, so we, when we are here in this region, um, in fact, looking at the phase diagrams that I was showing, here in this region, we are indeed um, 
already in this uh, gapped polarized phase, so in the, where, where the magnon uh, appears. So um, it would be very interesting to see, indeed, if you uh, change the conditions of your system uh, that will also influence the, uh, the state of your system, whether this shoulder is also, um, is also uh, modified. I think, I think it's, it's, it's interesting to analyze that because, um, of course, you are going to change the excitations in your system, and therefore this should have some, um, some appearance in this, in this kind of quantity. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Well, I can see Sam Carr uh, on. Okay, Sam. Sam, do you want to um, ask your question, Sam Carr? Oh yeah, sure. Um, if there's nobody else. Yeah, not. Oh, so, yes, I was just quite curious um, about the phase transition between the two different spin liquids, um, the U1 and the Z2, because presumably that's yes. some form of quantum critical point, but. Do you have any idea how that would be classified? Okay, so this, uh, this um, let me tell you a little bit the story of this intermediate phase. So this was uh, in, uh, I think the first work where they talk about this phase uh, and this, um, this work and this work and, and this work, it was done for, so let's take the antiferromagnetic KITIF model and um, um, these are mostly exact diagonalization uh, calculations uh, here in, in, in these are um, in, from Golk, Matthias Golka and collaborators. These are DMRG calculations. So it's a numerical way of looking at this phase. So this I have to tell because this is the numerics that show you that um, once you enter this phase, there is uh, in fact uh, um, uh, uh, your gap. You basically go into a gapless phase. Uh, and right now, as far as I know, uh, there are only, we also did exact diagonalization. And this is the only thing you can analyze, basically what happened to your excitations. So I don't think that there is a deep um, analysis in, in, let's say, in, which is not numerical, numerics related. So um, this is what we know right now about these phases. And uh, here, uh, Kiaran and, and Simon, they also did exact diagonalization. So again, analyzing what happens with your excitation spectrum as soon as you put a, a, a finite magnetic field. And you, you see a change of excitation spectrum between these two states. You also analyze, for instance, the omega order parameter that I didn't uh, show here. So this um, product of S uh, operators, and you also see a change in the om uh, omega parameter. So you are, you are rather sure that you go into a new phase. Okay, but you don't know for sure it would be a second order phase transition or anything? No, I don't think that, I, at least I can tell from our numerics, this, this is difficult to, um, to uh, analyze. I mean, it's, we are limited by the, um, basically by the size, uh, size effects, so finite size okay, effects. Thank you. Well, Maybe well, I, can... I see that Piers has uh, raised the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll ask. First of all, thank you for a, a, beautiful, a beautiful talk. Um, I wanted to ask a, a, a question really for pedagogical reasons at the very, connect with the very beginning of the talk. Could you give us a simple physical reason why the super exchange J is suppressed for edge sharing octahedra in your spin a half uh, multiplet? Yes. It went past very uh, yes. quickly. Let me go to I, here. I, it's a very important issue. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, yes, it is. It is. So let me uh, let me here for the moment assume that I don't allow a direct interaction between these two. Okay. So the only interaction that is happening be between these two um, uh, transition metal ions is through the ligand, so chlorine or oxygen, depending on the system you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then I have, in principle, two possible interaction paths so through this chlorine and through this chlorine. Mm -hmm. And these two paths, they basically uh, build a destructive, uh -huh. um, uh, a dest so, so they basically compensate each other. I see. Okay. If, and, and this, uh, thanks for asking, 
if of course I'm not allowing the direct uh, in exchange between balls. So yes. here I'm assuming that the distance between these two is far enough that only this is the important interaction. Okay. Through the through the through the p orbitals. So, so, Which, so is that because the effective hopping between the two sites has been destructively interfered to be zero? Is that the right way of thinking about it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Not a destructive interference. Exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got some time. We've got ten minutes. There's still yeah. There's still one more question from yes. Liang Liang Wu again. Yeah. So since uh, there is uh, still, I think there's still seven minutes left. I hope it's fine to ask another question. So sorry, sorry. I still have a question about the UN Spring Liquid. So I mean, uh, Sentil gave, gave two talks like in the past maybe last week. Yeah. Um, so like in his picture, in order to kind of host U1 spin liquid phase, the system needs to be kind of uh, close to, uh, in other words, the mod gap needs to be small so that you can tune like a, through a mod insulate transition that in his uh, uh, picture. But by Rosina Cora, I think the gap, the mod gap is like uh, 200 milli EV, right? Uh, well, I mean, there's this, yeah, okay, the charge gap is about 1.5 uh, electron volts. Um, and but, uh, yeah, there is, there is a discussion about the gap, but yes. So, 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 so the, the, the gap I'm talking about is between the, the J uh, equal to J effective to one half and uh, uh, to the three half. I think that gap mm -hmm. is 200 yes. milli uh, yeah. yes. according to optical measurement. Yes, that's correct. So, and uh, so 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 then 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 when 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 like when you talk talk about like gapless like a U one spin liquid so do you mean the kind of spin spin, spin part spin part yes yes the spin the spin part so so the yes. so the charge part can still be a mock insulator but the spin 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 part can be gapless yes 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 yes. Yes, so, so exactly. Um, because we always have to distinguish, thanks for the question, we always have, have to distinguish between the charge gap and the spin gap. And this would correspond to a phase where the spin gap is zero, this intermediate phase. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Well, I don't see any questions here. Okay. So I stop sharing. Um, yeah. Although I, I, I just wonder whether um, you have anything to say about Hide's uh, new new system. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <clears throat> yeah, that's. And I think this is a very interesting system. I mean, Hide already um, said a little bit about that. Um, the fact that um, there are these. Uh, so the system basically you have this hydrogen. In, uh, so they, they basically substitute lithium by hydrogen. And um, these hydrogens are extremely important in order to determine uh, the interactions in the layer. Um, and moreover, what uh, we analyze a little bit uh, these effects because hydrogen, in fact, is doing some type of quantum tunneling there between, um, between the, the oxygens. And what we found is that uh, probably the system uh, would be described by um, a very disordered bonds. Uh -huh. So uh, it, disorder is important in this system. And um, so we did some modeling on, on that. Uh, for instance, Nat Natalia Perkins and Johannes Knoller and Roderick Mosner has, have been also looking at that. So this system is not the typical KITAF type of system, but it has uh, it has this part of disorder that I think it's interesting to, to look into that. So, um, which disorder in these other materials um, has a different type of, um, basically, uh, it, it's, it's different there, uh, what disorder is doing. Uh, uh, Liang, do you still have another question or, or have you not? Lord, oh, no, I don't, I don't have further questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.
Uh, in that case, anyone else? Okay, so maybe we can slightly early, but uh, nevertheless, we let's uh, uh, thank uh, Rosa again. Unmute and thank uh, clap for Rosa. Thank you. Talk. And uh, Piers, are you going to um, break us up into uh, breakout rooms? Yes, I'm going to break uh, break everyone up into breakout rooms. Thank you, Rosa, for such a wonderful talk. It was very, very clear, very pedagogical. Um, and uh, uh, we are now about 90 people, so I'm going to break us up into about 10 breakout rooms. Thanks very much, everyone. And see you in half. Are we going to take a Johannes, Johannes Noller's uh, talk will be in, uh, not, sorry, Johannes Lichner's Lichner. talk will be in, 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 what, in half an hour. Half an hour, yeah.